Okay, I think uh, time is now. We have a bit of a finite window here and quite a bit to cover of a rather engaging nature. So let us dive in. I, I, I see folks trickling in. Uh, we'll uh, allow them to join as, uh, as they do. Uh, but let me first start by introducing myself. My name is Todd Moran. I am the Chief Learning Strategist at NovoEd. And for the better part of two decades, I sat in your chair and I wrestled with the things that you're wrestling with today around capability development, staffing for the organization, alignment to the business, digital transformation at scale. So I will try to bring as much of that customer perspective today, and I am joined by two rather insightful thought leaders that I will introduce uh, in just a moment uh, to help us walk through this dialogue today about this big reset and about the capability building. And when I think um, just for a moment about NovoEd and our founding, uh, it's the Stanford Algorithm Lab back in 2012, so much of our passion and our focus really derives from this place around focused efforts around deep collaborative immersive learning experiences that truly drive business impact that is who we are that is what we care about and i think that's why so many of you um, are on the call today is to you care about these same things and you're wrestling with these same challenges and you want to hear some insights and some guidance and some perspective and we will do all of that uh, all of that today but let me start with just a little bit of housekeeping we intend to go very slide light uh, in, in the, in the uh, sort of immortal words of Edward Tufte, we will not do death by PowerPoint. So encourage you, to, uh, even though you're all on mute, to interact with us, to share with myself, uh, with the, the panelists that I'll introduce here in a moment, uh, and do that through the question segment uh, in your GoToMeeting uh, options. So we'll take questions throughout. I will try to feather those into the dialogue and the discussion, and we've left some dedicated time uh, at the end as well to, to focus on that and of course uh, as many of you ask the, the what little slides and the recording itself we will undoubtedly make available to all of you inside 48 hours here so uh, when we think about this and why each of you came to the call today you're going to hear some phenomenal insights but I thought it perhaps most uh, prescient and most important to, to kick this dialogue off with some interaction from all of you. So what I'd like to do is open with a poll uh, in, in really to get a sense from each and every one of you around what are those biggest learning centric challenges that are facing your organization today? And as we play this poll up on your screen, I'll give folks a little bit of time to respond, but a couple different areas. I, are you feeling that intense downward pressure from your C-suite around deep alignment to core business? Is it around uh, challenges uh, it's to the title of this presentation itself and webinar around capability building and how do you do that at scale across the employee base, hard skill, soft skill, and what's the difference between those? Um, perhaps it's the supporting technologies that are holding you back. Do you have the platforms, those technology stacks in place today or uh, the, the always challenging one that I wrestled with so many times in, in my enterprise, you know, certainly the budgetary constraints. And for those of you that, uh, that tick other, I would encourage you to put that other entry into the question segment of your panel because we may very well have left a glaring omission off of this list. Uh, and I think that's important to give you the, a voice and a chance to, uh, to respond into, into that space. So um, we'll give folks just, a, just a, a few more minutes here. I think we've got about 62% or so of the, uh, the team that has voted, uh, the audience, and we'll give a chance um, for others to weigh in. I think this is so important. And then we can go ahead and uh, we'll close this poll and play this back out. And, I, and before I pivot to, in, to introduce our panelists, it'll give them a little bit of food for thought. And maybe there's some themes that we can kind of pull through our dialogue today as we share with each of you. So I think we're about just tipping the scales around 70%. We can go ahead and publish that poll back out and let's get a sense of where folks are, uh, are wrestling with. In, in, intriguing to, uh, to, to sort of see the rather balanced, I would say, uh, overlay in terms of where where these big challenges are. I, I didn't mean to frighten all of you with this uh, this concept of <clears throat> we're in Halloween season and what's keeping you up at night and the scary factor here, uh, but these are all very real and they're all very tangible challenges that I think we all feel. So uh, we'll go ahead and we can dismiss that poll and I will take us on to, um, I think, some really important introductions. So I'm joined today uh, by two rather phenomenal thought leaders in this space. Um, let me start with Scott Kinney. He is the current Chief Executive Officer and Chairman of Novoet, uh, and that was acquired by uh, Devonshire back in 2018. Uh, and he also leads in his capacity and unique lens, the education technology team for Devonshire Investors, which is the private equity investment arm of Fidelity. So the perspective that Scott will bring today on the, the call, I think will be great. Scott, welcome, uh, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, Todd. Great to be here. Hi, everyone. 
And secondly, uh, many of you read his work, you engage him on many levels, you've seen him at different events. Uh, Josh Burson, obviously a global industry analyst leader, uh, founder and principal at the JBA, Josh Burson Academy, uh, does a ton of writing, is constantly out inter interacting and engaging in this space. Uh, someone that we, we, we seek uh, counsel often uh, and has a really phenomenal perspective about what's happening. And I think this will be a rather uh, engaging and uh, telling dialogue. So let me do this. I'm gonna go ahead and stop um, my screen sharing here and allow us just to focus on uh, the three of us. And uh, here's what we want to do. There's kind of three key things, three key themes that we'd like to step through today around the shifting, uh, changing nature of the role of L&D, around capabilities uh, and the importance of those, uh, the delta to skills and how those things are different. And then a little bit around this evolution of learning and learning technologies. Uh, but before we dive in with, with all of that, perhaps I'll do and allow each of you to do a bit of table setting. Uh, and, and Scott, if I could, maybe I'll start with you. And I think your lens is a rather unique one. So when I think about um, this perspective of you as both an operator running a CEO of Novoet, an investor helping to execute decisions and investments on behalf of Devonshire, um, wh what do you see as sort of the, the, the biggest uh, challenges or changes maybe perhaps more apropos uh, in CEO, CEO priorities and, and ultimately uh, by association, you know, how are those um, uh, affecting the most mission critical priorities for enterprise learning? Maybe we'll start with that. Sure, thanks Todd. Josh, always good to see you. Uh, Thank hope you. you're well. Yep. So, um, thanks. Uh, you know, when I, when I think about the evolving, rapidly evolving expectations for learning leaders, chief learning officers, CHROs, <clears throat> those should be a, a direct function of the priorities and strategies of the CEO and, and company leadership. So when I when I think about what's happening with uh, corporate leadership right now, I think it's an in incredibly demanding and, um, and fascinating time. There are three huge factors that are weighing on CEOs right now, just describe them briefly. So the first is, is this imperative for digital transformation. You know, there's a lot of talk that we're in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. The first one was steam power that allowed you to create factories and railroads. And then the second industrial revolution was uh, powered by electricity that allowed you to automate uh, a lot of processes. The third was the computer age, which sort of dawned in the 60s and 70s and 80s. My father was actually an early employee at Control Data Corporation, which some of our um, more um, seasoned, experienced attendees might remember as a, a pioneer in helping create that, uh, that computer age. And we're now in this um, digital age where the physical, biological, digital worlds are all melding in um, ways. And in, in every one of those revolutions, you had to adapt and transform or become obsolete. And there's plenty of, there's many more examples of businesses that became obsolete than those that were able to adapt and evolve and, and thrive, though there are plenty of those kinds of businesses too. So this imperative that CEOs have to drive a digital transformation uh, or become obsolete for the last three, four, five years has really become a big driver of strategy and of HR activity as a result at large corporations. So that's one. That alone would be daunting and, and it, it, there are skill gaps, there are cultural gaps. The second transformation though is more around that cultural dimension. And this is sort of the, the culmination of the, the Me Too movement of the DE&I uh, and racial justice um, uh, uh, vectors and, and all the things that have been happening in that space. I mean, it, it has a historical basis too. It goes back to certainly the civil rights uh, era of the 50s and 60s, gender wage gap issues that really became, uh, got a lot of attention in the 70s and 80s. There's still a big pay gap um, between men and women in the workplace doing the same job, about 21% uh, actually. And so now that we've got uh, all this additional uh, attention on important issues like um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and Me Too, large corporations are having to transform their cultures. And again, it's an issue of, 
adapt or die, transform or become obsolete. And so there's a huge amount of, of pressure on CEOs to do that. That also translates into priorities and work uh, for HR teams and learning teams. And then finally, we have the pandemic. And the, and the, the difference there is that that's an event. <clears throat> it has a start. We're somewhere in the middle, somewhere. It'll have an end uh, at some point, whereas the other two are long, uh, you know, acceleration of trends that have been building um, for quite some time. But I think this pandemic is causing at least two really um, massive factors. One is the immediate and urgent need to move all sorts of practices online that used to take place in person, learning being a big one of those. But then the second, I think, is much is going to be much more um, pervasive long term, and that's that companies are realizing that the fluidity in the workforce is going to be here to stay. And you're, we're going to have to meet employees where they are with consumer grade learning experiences, regardless of device or location, and they've got to be able to be productive. And again, it's it's a situation of transform your business to be able to do that or you'll become obsolete. So I think the combination of these three things can be almost overwhelming uh, for CEOs because what do they make a priority? What do they drive? And that translates into a lot of pressure on chief learning officers because learning, I think there are a lot of good things about this. Learning is seen as an enabler to make progress in all these dimensions, digital transformation, cultural transformation, and um, dealing with a, a uh, distributed workforce. Um, the last thing I want to say is that as an investor, what does this mean? What's going on in the market? Uh, what's happening? It, capital is uh, flooding into the ed tech space at a higher rate than it was pre-pandemic. There was a bit of a dip in Q2. So in Q2, uh, uh, people held back because they didn't know what was going on. A lot of uh, fundraises and uh, M&A activities slowed down or stopped, but it's come back with a vengeance. And it's really, I mean, it's definitely going into K-12 and higher ed, which aren't part of our scope for today, but those spaces are really going through um, a revolutionary change and will be. Um, whereas I think it's a bit more evolutionary for uh, workplace, but there's a lot of investment flooding in. Um, that means there's gonna be more innovation. And one thing I just heard earlier this week from a major venture investor in ed tech is they're seeing kind of for the first time uh, in the last 10 years when venture activity has been ramping up in ed tech, they're seeing really high caliber teams founding new businesses uh, in this space. And uh, there, there are always mission-driven entrepreneurs who are attracted to ed tech and attracted to learning. Um, but now you're getting people who've had three or four successes in other tech areas entering this space because they see it not only as important, but also as uh, uh, likely to undergo a great deal of disruptive and positive change going forward. So I think it's a great time to be in this sector, but lots of pressures on, on CLOs. And I'll stop there. No, I appreciate the, the, the candor and the insight, Scott, and maybe, uh, Josh, I'd love to get your reaction to that and maybe tag on with a question of your own. You're, you're obviously talking to those same learning leaders, but also beyond, to HR, to talent, to uh, folks every day at scale, and we'd be intrigued if some of those those accelerating themes that, that Scott mentioned are resonating in what you're hearing in those conversations, or, or are there others? Or what becomes sure. top of mind for, uh, for that group? Well, I totally agree with everything Scott was just talking about. In addition to that, um, I, I think the problem that, that many of the people in this webinar are dealing with is that running corporate training is really complicated. It is much harder than it looks. And I noticed that in the poll, the, the no, very slightly number one, 53% or so said that the number one issue is aligning with the business. And um, that's the problem is that there's a million problem. There's a million things out there to do, um, and every HR, every person in the company who ever had a performance problem blamed training for the problem. Oh, you know, we're we're behind on our sales numbers. It's because they don't know how to sell. We're behind in our customer service. Well, we need to train the customer service people. Everything can be blamed on training, and so 
when you're running L and D, you're you're constantly barraged with well-intended uh, requests for support, training, education, pro coaching, programs, certifications, whatever, um, and you can never keep up because there's what there's always too many. So uh, so I think and we have this huge belief system. Oh, I'm going to turn on the AI and it's going to determine all the skills I need and bloop, all the problems will go away. In fact, I just got off the phone right before this call with a CHRO of a very big company. And I won't mention her name. And she said, well, I don't think formal education is that necessary. I think we're going to have AI that's going to figure out everything that everybody knows. It's going to infer their skills and then we can directly send them the information they need. And I'm like, yeah, maybe someday, but I don't think so. Um, so, so I think the, you know, this is not a new problem, but particularly now, where do you spend your time? How do you focus your efforts? What do you build versus buy? Um, where do you spend money and where, where do you not spend money? And, and the thing about what Scott was saying, the nice thing about the VC and the, and the investment communities, there are a lot of options. There's a lot of content companies, there's a lot of tech companies, there's a lot of platform companies but you can't use all of them. You have to figure out which ones are gonna be the most important and how do you stitch them together? So, so I think the challenges in L&D are really almost inspiringly complex right now in a world where the pandemic and all these other issues have created enormous demand. So, so I completely agree. Um, and then in terms of HR, the big thing going on in the HR domain is rethinking development as a continuous, um, uh, you know, sort of marketplace problem, not a hierarchical problem. You know, in the old version of a company, the old version of, of you got trained in your job, and then when you got good at that, then you get trained at the next job, and then you get trained at the next job, and you had a linear path of a career and linear path of learning, and the L&D department could create these, we used to call them colleges and corporate universities, and you would go to the College of Sales or the College of Leadership or the College of Safety, and you'd kind of work your way up, you know, over a period of decades, really. Well, that's not really what, the way it works anymore. Now, everybody kind of needs to learn something new almost every week. So um, so our, our friends in HR, sort of the, the sister part of L&D, are now looking at talent mobility and talent marketplaces and uh, project work, and they're saying, well, this is kind of the future you over there in L&D, you better keep up with us. We're moving fast. And so your curriculum and your content better adapt to this. And so that's another set of challenges on L&D. So Josh, I'd be intrigued if we could pull a thread on this too, because I think part of, Scott, your statement around the downward pressure of adapt, adapt or perish to some degree, if I'm paraphrasing that one, around how, how does that specifically impact the role of L&D? So is it, Josh, maybe I can start with you on that. Is it literally the idea of pivoting? It's we have to hire entire totally different teams that are who, whom we're staffing with. Is it get in line with the nature of talent because everything is trending towards that talent sort of trajectory and career pathing and mobility as you spoke about? Or what, how, how can the folks that are very learning centric today, well, I mean, call, first, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, what well, perhaps, yeah, maybe. yeah, let me give you a concept for this. And we'll talk about this in the capability academies part two. I, I think you have to consider L&D to be an adaptive function. It's not a linear waterfall approach to training like problem design implement roll out measure i mean that has to happen but it has to happen much faster we just finished a piece of research it's going to be published next week with a consulting firm on what we call adaptive learning organizations and we asked about um you know a, a large number of companies do you use the water model fall model do you use the agile model uh, do you continuously monitor every program to see how successful it is, or do you just sort of roll it out and then look at the end? Um, are, you are you building the capabilities of the L&D team on a regular basis? How closely are you monitoring the future of work initiatives in your company and so forth? We asked them about 20 of these questions, and we then took the answers and we grouped the companies into four groups. The really high-performing companies, the companies that were performing well, the companies that were underperforming, and the companies that were really, really suffering. And sure enough, there was a completely direct relationship to the level of agility of L&D and the business performance of the companies, financially, Glassdoor, and other things. So 
Um, so we've got to sort of think about L and D as a um, as a digital operation, basically, uh, just like everything else. And I think a lot of you guys know that. I mean, I think L and D people get this maybe more than anybody else in HR, but but it's it's hard to do at scale. It's really interesting, and Josh, you um, probably uh, are seeing this as well, but the the role of a learning leader or chief learning officer that title is even a relatively recent construct uh within corporate hierarchies but uh it's it evolved from a a training leadership role to a more broad hr role but now it needs to be uh, a, a strategy job and a technology integrator job so um if you take the very real HR, human capital piece, technology integration, and and sophisticated strategic thinking, that's a big ask. And I find it really fascinating when um, companies are looking for a new chief learning officer, uh, some of them are starting to change what that job definition looks like. And they bring right. in somebody who used to be a CTO, or they bring in somebody who used to be a, a chief strategy officer, and or they have them report up into some place other than the CHRO, maybe right to the CEO or a COO or some other C-suite. And it, there's optics to that, and then there's uh, practical uh, issues to that. But I think that reflects that sort of a, a, a symptom, a reaction to this shifting uh, set of complexity and, and to your point before, just how hard it is to do. Yeah, and I think, absolutely, I mean, ideally, if you could design the organization perfectly, the chief learning officer would be called the chief capability officer or something like that, and they would be worried about learning capabilities, culture, you know, knowledge sharing, and they probably would be a peer of the CHRO. They would work with the CHRO, but they wouldn't be buried under the, you know, CHRO, head of talent, head of learning, you know, like you kind of get buried down there and all of a sudden you're in a very tactile situation. Um, but but not every company is ready for that. The, the other thing that's very, very challenging in L&D is the distributed nature of the problem. You know, my very first research study that I did when I became an analyst was called the High Impact Learning Organization. And the number one thing we tried to figure out was the operating model for L&D. You know, should it be centralized? Should it be decentralized? Should it be hybrid? which we call federated, what gets centralized, what doesn't get centralized. And, and you know, the problem that you run into is no matter what you try to centralize to standardize, somebody out there says, ah, the heck with them, I'm gonna go buy something that works for us. And the next thing you know, you have this splintering of, of content and technologies and tools and, and, and providers. Um, and I think that's just the nature of the beast. <laughs> Yeah, and that was not nearly as harmful to organizations when most of learning was a in-person uh, instructor-led right. situation because you might have different leaders, different people coming in, different methodologies. But now you've got the issue of enterprise-wide technology versus local technology, and they don't necessarily talk to each other or to the LMS or and now it's a much thornier problem if you lose control of that. So I, I, I've been intrigued. I wonder if we're going to now see uh, ladders.com explode with chief capability officer is, uh, is the new listing and people feverishly putting well, in you know, uh, job response. To that, I, want to, I want to explain that word to you guys when we get to that, Todd. I, I mean, I, I, I've yeah. been pushing that word a lot, and I think it's an important word to sort of talk about. No, and I think let's do it. And I would encourage, I, I have to imagine, you know, somewhat controversial in the nature of uh, org structures. And, and there, you know, we've got a, a lot of people uh, on the line. would love to hear sort of, you know, does that resonate? Well, Are there people you thinking about, okay, other so challenges? You guys, listen, I see there's 150 of you and you guys all have a lot of expertise in this. Um, if you go back 10 or 15 years or 20 years, when I first got an L&D, what used to happen is it used to be a performance consulting exercise where you would figure out what the problem is, you would diagnose the learning issues in the problem, and then you would create a course that would solve that. Um, and somewhere in the last 20 years, all these software vendors started to say, well, you know what, I'm just gonna figure out what skills you have by looking at your resume, because we can do that for recruiting, because in recruiting we can 
look at the job description and we can look at your resume and we can kind of figure out if you're even a good fit. And basically the skills uh, taxonomies and the skills inference came out of recruiting, didn't come out of L&D. And so they took all that matching technology and they said, we're gonna build a skills cloud. So Workday introduced the skills cloud, all the LXPs introduced the skills cloud, um, you know, virtually every vendor sort of has something like that. And, and, and then you go to LinkedIn and you say, oh, you know, click your skills, click, 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 click. And a bunch of other people say, yeah, 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 you have all those skills and boom, now all of a sudden you have all the skills. Well, there's two problems with that. Number one, it's very inaccurate um, unless the company really manages it well. Most companies don't or it's an early stage. And the second thing is that actually doing a job well takes more complex capabilities than what are usually referred to as skills. Because the word skill, I was talking to MZ about this, the word skill doesn't really mean a lot. What it really means is I read a job description and it asked for this thing, and so we're gonna call it a skill, whatever this thing is. It's a word. It might say computer programming. Well, what the heck is that? I mean, there's a thousand pieces of computer programming how are you going to teach somebody computer programming? So, um, so what I suggest for your guys' standpoint in the L&D, because we need to we need to deal with this problem, is when you go out there and you talk to a business owner or a business group about a problem, you're going to find out that there are business capabilities they need. I need if I'm a salesperson, I need to know how to qualify accounts. I need to know how to develop rapport. I need to know how to propose a solution, our solution, not just a general solution, the solution we sell. Um, I need to know how to handle objections. I need to know the competitors, whatever. You know, and those, some of those are generic, but most of those are very specific to that company. And once you figure out what those are as an L&D professional, you can create an incredibly good solution to build those capabilities. It's gonna be training, it's gonna be mentoring, it's gonna be knowledge experts, it's going to be information online, it's going to be micro learning, it's going to be some, you know, outside experts, maybe it's some university professors. Um, and, and that is what the job we're here to do. That is what, what we're getting paid for in L&D is solving that problem. Now, if the skills inference engine works and helps, great. We'll recommend better content, but that's not going to solve the problem. So that's, that's, that's my experience with this. And, you know, I have been sort of preaching this to you guys obviously get it because this is where you came from. NovoEd was founded really on this idea. Um, but more and more people are beginning to use this word because it's a better way of describing the problem. And, and that's, that's my sort of the beginning of my conversation about skills versus capabilities. We can talk about it some more. <laughs> no, Scott, I, I'd love to hear it because it's so yeah, much right in line to where we started. I, I don't see it. It's interesting. I was talking to a CHRO recently who kind of put skills and capabilities into the same bucket uh, and referred to them as skills. Yeah. And that implies a certain approach to how you would want to close that skills gap. Tends to be more self-paced, uh, tends to be you engaging with content, and there's an assessment uh, component. There might be mentoring and coaching, maybe. but if you think about HR organizations and learning organizations really trying to move their company forward, especially along these challenging dimensions of digital transformation, cultural transformation, remote workforce, um, what really is going to get them there is not those tactical skills. Absolutely, Do they need people who know how to program in Python? Of course they do. And there's a pathway to get there. And that's probably the learning organization's responsibility to figure out how to do that well. But much more challenging, how do you get the collaboration? How do you get the right kind of influence, leadership, um, presenting a business case, uh, right. gaining support for your ideas, all those kinds of capabilities. Learning can be a huge enabler there, but it's a different process to get there. It's not just you and the computer. It's interaction, it's giving and receiving feedback, it's practicing, um, it is mentoring and coaching. All those are proven 
um, practices in producing strong outcomes and business impact. We've been doing it for a long time. We just used to only be able to do it in person. Now we can do it in right. person. We can do it online. We can do it in combination. Um, we probably can only do it online for, you know, another six to 12 months or something like that. But these skills and capabilities, if you want to oversimplify and put them in those two buckets, very, very different in how you think about it, how you, uh, learning might still be accountable for both of them, um, but you've got to have tailored strategies about how you're going to get there. Well, and I think I think the language, I mean, I know some people use the word skill for everything. I, I, I think it actually is helpful to, to, to delineate a skill from a capability. A skill is, I know how to use Excel. The capability is, I know how to do a budget for a P&L for a large organization. It's going to take you a lot more than an online course for an hour to know how to do a budget well. But I could learn Excel in an hour. So I actually think it's easier if we separate the two, although I know some people use the word skill for everything. The other thing that I've always thought was a little bit weird is this idea of, oh, we're going to fill the skills gaps. Well, you know, it isn't a gap. It's like it's, it's a continuous gap that's always being filled better and better and better. Because one of the things you realize, you know, if you've been around as long as I have, you're always learning, you're always getting better at things. There's the soft skills versus the hard skills, as Scott was saying. And um, capability development is a never ending um, journey for, for you guys in L&D. And so you need an architecture and a solution and a platform and sort of a business model that allows you to do that. When, when I sort of came up with this idea of a capability academy, which we're writing a white paper on, and you guys will get that, um, it somewhat came from my experience in HR where I, when we were trying to build our academy, I realized a bunch of one hour courses isn't gonna cut it. It's too complicated. It's a bunch of experiences, mentors, examples, case studies, uh, different uh, experts, um, you know, assessments. It's just it's many, many elements to it. And you guys need the freedom to think about the problem in a holistic way, as opposed to, we're gonna put a bunch of programs out there, buy an LXP, turn on the skills engine, and then everybody will just be happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's hope, hope is not a strategy, Josh. Right? That's what, yeah. uh, from that perspective. We, we, interesting one from um, from some of the audience. We, we, we take it. There's agreement around this distinction between skills and capabilities, which I think you are both of, of a, a similar mindset. Who best to figure out what are those sort of critical skills capabilities that sort of exist? Is it is it is it the, the sole behest of L and D? Is it HR? Is it the business? Is it tighter alignment? Is it back to that opening poll question? I, I would love to hear both perspectives because I think Scott, we've had customers that have just recently wrestled with this, and Josh, you've got a sort of a really broad perspective there as well. Yeah, you go first, Josh. Well, in terms of what what works, I, I mean, I think, I, I mean, listen, there's a million things you can do in L and D that can that can be important. The technology is important, the infrastructure, the tools, the content, all that. I think the biggest thing, though, that, that came out as the number one issue on your guys' poll is business alignment. Are you working on the big problems yourself? I mean, because you can outsource the small problems. You can buy a content library for a bunch of stuff that you don't have time to do and just send people over there. Um, but do you know what the big problems are? And are you getting under the covers of them in a meaningful way? And when I came, you know, my idea of a capability academy, a good idea, a good example of this is, you know, what, what, uh, what they do at Colgate. They went through and looked at the marketing organization at Colgate, which is massively complex and very, very important. Um, you know, all of the consumer packaged goods companies, you know, are marketing at, at their core um, and went through the different roles of different marketing professionals and said, you know what, there's maybe five or six of these in families and each one have new people, level one, they have intermediate people, and they have advanced people. We need programs that can meet the needs of new, intermediate, and advanced in these four or five uh, job families. And they built this capability model for marketing. And then they realized, you know, we need a lot of pieces to solve these gaps. We need experts, we need content, we need formal programs, we need informal programs, and so forth. So it was the capability development 
um, exercise that got them started. And it, it was interesting, you know, uh, Brad, who's the CLO of Colgate, came from marketing. He didn't even come from HR. So he just came in with basically, you know, no knowledge of how to do this. But he said, look, this is the problem. We're going to work on this problem. And I, I would encourage you to just spend, you know, in an L&D, spend your time on that um, issue and then, you know, decide which of the many, many things on your list are tactical, operational, uh, can be outsourced, can be put into a library and thrown, you know, into a, an off-the-shelf library so you don't get bogged down in them. And my, you know, ex experience with these capability academies is that they should be led by the business, not by you. That the head of sales should be the head of the capability academy for sales. Now, they don't have to work on it all day, but that person should be telling you and directing you um, on the things that are the most important in the sales organization, the head of safety, the head of compliance, whatever the problems are you want to solve. And they, they can be your stakeholders to make sure that the problems you're working on are always relevant to what's going on in the business every year, because every year they change. And then once you get a good programmatic infrastructure and you use a tool like NovoEd or you know, a platform like NovoEd that allows you to bring lots of experts in, you can continuously involve your programs to meet their needs and you're always going to be relevant and you're always going to have a high ROI of your programs. So that's, you know, to me, that's, you know, the core of this. And then under the covers, of course, uh, is making sure you have good enough technology that things don't just fall apart <laughs> and that the, the learner experience is positive and people don't just give up because they can't find anything or they can't get access to the content. Just on this question about whose job it is to define these skills uh, or capabilities, you know, one thing that I think happens too often in companies is, let's just take this topic of cultural transformation because it's on uh, the agenda of every board of directors meeting for every large company uh, in a, it, probably in the world right now, certainly here in the US. And so there might be a statement that comes from the CEO that we are going to be a more inclusive workplace. It's going to be, it's going to have these, uh, uh, this is a, this is a priority for us. But then there's not a process for working backwards from that saying, all right, well, what would that look like? What would success right. look like? How would we measure that? How would we measure it quantitatively, qualitatively? What does that mean for what would have to happen? Eventually you get back to what skills need to, to, uh, to be right. developed. Right. Too often there would be, all right, unconscious bias is a problem, it's a blocker, so let's do this program for our managers on removing unconscious bias. But there's no connection between what that is going to produce and this overall corporate goal priority of being a more inclusive workplace. So I think it does take a cross-functional effort. These are hard to organize, but work backwards, all right, let's take that priority, let's work backwards, and ultimately it will be the HR organization and the learning organization that will have to connect those dots back to, here are the core skills we're gonna develop, and then here's the programs we're going to deploy to get there. Um, you might still do a removal of unconscious bias program, but yeah. now it's part of a system, now it's part right, of a, right. a it's program. It's in the context, of, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, Novo had a uh, has a large uh, large client global building materials manufacturer, one of the largest in the world, and they had a very clear vision for a major cultural change. Uh, this is a very old company bound by a lot of old uh, practices, and they've been very happy with the results over the last few years. I think because they were explicit about. Uh, defining what success was going to look like and working backwards to the point of then having programs for managers, for leaders, for everybody that then makes sense. And uh, so I think there's a real important strategic uh, component to this. Yeah, like picking up lines deeply, there's like a watch of a slew of comments coming in around the sort of the pace of change and you know how to best assess and you know coming up with those those qualitative and quantitative metrics that become so important. So I, I think what you're you're saying has resonated with, with with so many out there. Maybe a wise transition as we think about the isolation of capabilities and skills, and we think more broadly about the ever sort of evolving nature of learning and learning technologies. 
would love to get your respective takes on this. So we think about, um, you know, what are you seeing there? How, you know, how are learning learning technologies evolving? You know, where are those sort of, uh, sort of focal points, you know, be, being placed? Um, Josh, maybe, maybe you start sure. with me with well, that. Sort of, you know, there's, there's a couple of people, I'm looking at the names, there's a couple of people on this webinar that know this stuff very well. Um, you know, learning, it's interesting. I think learning technology is the most complex and interesting part of the whole HR domain. It is by far the most innovative area. I mean, I think TikTok is a new paradigm for learning. Conversational learning is new. Chatbots, virtual reality. Um, you know, there's just a dozen new ideas all the time on how we can make learning better and more interesting. The big themes are, um, first of all, making it available in the flow of work so you can find the content quickly, get access to it without clicking through 17 clicks to find it in the LMS and then realize you enrolled in the wrong course. Um, you know, that's number one. Number two is making the content more um, conversational so that even though, you know, I, maybe I have 15 minutes to go through this program right now and then I wanna come back later this afternoon. Um, can I do that? You know, and my, will my phone remind me that I have to go back and finish that? Uh, and I don't have to sort of lock myself into this learning experience and never leave. You know, one of the reasons I've, I, you know, I've, I've been reading up a lot on TikTok. One of the reasons TikTok is so successful is it starts within a second when you open it and it's always there. You don't have to wait to find it. So there's this, this issue in our lives that we don't have as much time. We don't seem to for that. And the third is um, the completeness of the learning experience. You know, if you look at sophisticated companies, I know one of the guys on the call here used to work at Comcast, and you look at the companies that have been doing a lot of learning and for a long time, they don't just have one type of content. They have mentoring, they have, you know, exercises, they have labs, they have formal training by instructors, they have self-study, they have books. They have online, you know, support job aids. Um, you know, you, you have to find a platform that does more than one thing because it won't be enough. You go out and buy LinkedIn Learning. It's great. It looks like fun, but it's they're all one-hour videos. Every single course is the same format, and it's limiting. There are certain things that just won't happen in those programs. So that's the third element. And maybe the fourth one is the data. Um, as much as you probably don't like it, you gotta know what's going on. And so you have to have some sort of a data infrastructure so that you can track not only who enrolled in what, but who completed, who stopped, how much time they spent on it, who's developing a high level of influence and authority, who isn't, who's warrants having a badge, um, you know, who are the people that are uh, highly contributing and therefore we wanna use them in more programs contributing to others, that, that's all data. And so I, I think it's pretty hard to run L&D without some help from either IT or somebody who's more like an architect so you can find all this data because it is, it is in different systems. You will, not, you will not find one learning platform that does everything. You will not find that. I think it's a really, uh, there's this double-edged sword dynamic going on right now where there has never been a better time for finding enterprise grade uh, platforms with consumer quality learning experiences that do a variety of things. Uh, and now I think two years from now that will mushroom and blossom even further. But I look at a lot of these, both with my investor hat and also NovoEd uh, CEO and chairman hat on as things that might be interesting partnerships for NovoEd or, or potential investments. And Every time I look at it and I think, well, that's really cool. That <laughs> I, I, if I were the chief learning officer of a large company, I'd be pretty interested in doing that. But that's a huge problem if you have dozens of these doing different things all over the place. Suddenly, how does anybody navigate their way through? And if you have this strategy about digital transformation, cultural transformation, how do I get from here to there? when all of these are either individual points of light or they're poorly integrated. Well, I, and I completely agree with you, Josh, that if you try to do all of those things with your LMS, it uh, doesn't matter what LMS you have, you won't be getting best in class um, experiences. 
it, the integration might be fine, but, and so well, it's, well, let's, that, yeah. that's a challenge. I mean, I think, first of all, let's just accept, accept that the LMS is a tracking system. It's not a learning system. Um, it never was intended to be a learning system. But, but I do think one of the things, you know, I was just looking at a couple of the comments. You kind of have to be willing to experiment as an L&D person. You're going to have to, you know, try NovoEd and see if it works. They'll help you do a good job with it. Try this other tool and see if it works. You're going to have to try two or three things. And one or two of them are going to be exceptionally successful. And some of them may turn out to be less successful and just say, okay, we're done. We don't need that anymore. Um, be careful you don't end up with a bunch of Tower of Babel. I mean, we actually do we do a lot of consulting in in bigger L and D departments where they have way too much stuff. Um, a lot of it isn't being used very much anymore. So so I think there's a you, you have to be a bit of an architect to filter them out. Um, and you know, and I think the, the other thing in terms of being a vendor or buying from vendors, and you know, obviously I I know a lot about NovoEd. You have to sort of look for vendors that are not just technology people, but also understand the domain and the problem they're trying to solve. There actually are a lot of really smart technologists that have jumped into HR and L&D and realized, ooh, it's a little more complicated than I thought it was. Ooh, I thought this was gonna be easy. I won't mention any names, Todd, but you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay tight-lipped. <laughs> It, it's a it's a complex domain with a lot of opportunity, but it takes focus on the problem, not just the technology. The technology itself has to be used to you know deal with these you know very complex human issues. So so I would be a little careful on just finding the met, you know the best whiz bang technology and assume it's going to work. It might, but it also might not. Can I, can I get both your reactions? Just pulling this thread on that sort of a changing role here. This one, I want to get this verbatim. I think a, a, a phenomenal question. High-performing team, learning teams with organizations optimize their capabilities around three pillars of success, strategic, financial, and operational excellence. Which one do you feel is most critical? Josh, can I, can I start with you? I'll put um, you on, on the spot for that one. Or, okay, so... Do you agree I with the premise of the question? You have to do all three. I don't, I don't think you can skip any of those. <laughs> Strategically, you have to focus on the right problems because you're going to get beaten up or fired if you don't. Because somebody like the CEO or the head of some business unit is going to be furious if you if you ignore the you know the enormous problem that they have or don't find a way to 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 outsource it to somebody else. In terms of financials. You know, I've never met a head of L&D that has an unlimited budget. Um, people do look, you know, right now, of course, we're in sort of a weird time where people are willing to spend money on this. But every time there's an economic slowdown, the first place they look to cut it is L&D. So you've got to be prepared to cost justify all the wonderful things you're doing. And I think once a year, you should do a little bit of a zero-based budgeting. We used to have this exercise <clears throat> that we used to do. Um, and I have a paper on this I can get in front of you guys, where we used to say, take all the programs you have and put them into four boxes. One axis is strategic versus operational. The other axis is custom versus off the shelf. Stick them wherever you want to put them and then take the stuff at the lower left and cut it in half. Get rid of half of it. And you should do that every year or two to um, keep your financials focused on the most important areas. Like right now, you should be investing in VR. You should be investing in soft skills. You should be experimenting with things that will uh, create well-being experiences and help people manage people at home. Uh, you know, you may not have had that in the budget last year. <clears throat> and then in terms of operational excellence, um, you know, L&D is a very operational thing. There's enrollments, there's people who get hung up in courses, they, they submit cases, they didn't get the data they need, they can't get their compliance to work. Somebody's got to deal with all that, otherwise they're going to hate you. So um, you either have to have that in your organization or you have to have IT or HR operations fully engaged in what you're doing. Um, you know, I was on the phone with, I think it was Bank of America a couple of weeks ago, and they had this massive, massive multi-month onboarding program for all of the um, customer-facing roles. Well, there's a giant group in, in operational, uh, you know, sort of IT services 
that just monitors people's success going through that program and handles cases as they go through all these learning programs so that if anybody gets tripped up in the middle of this learning experience, they can immediately get to somebody to help them. That's a pretty important factor too. So unfortunately, you don't get to ignore any of those. Yeah, I it. think <laughs> it's, a, it's a three legged stool um, challenge where if your project's gonna fail, it's gonna be because, be because one of those legs wasn't um, uh, working well enough for you. You can't fall short on the strategic side or financial or operational. And so that's why teams need to be heterogeneous. Uh, you need to get uh, um, a variety of skill sets on your team uh, so that you don't fall short. If everyone is a career HR person who may not have the same kind of exposure to the financial or strategic side, that that's gonna be a problem. I'll give you a live example of a success, though the other way around. We have a client at NovoEd who's a very large Wall Street uh, investment bank, global reach. And <clears throat> like a lot of people uh, in that industry, they onboard uh, a few thousand um, freshly minted MBAs and college grads into new analysts and other positions. That's not something they can skip just because there's a pandemic. They need to um, provide a very robust experience. So we worked with them to do that and it went really well. And the lead of that organization, the woman who um, sort of pulled all that off, who was uh, a senior learning leader, was just promoted to a general manager of a new important business unit uh, for the firm. And so it, it was somebody who already had a variety of different kinds of experiences and they're not rising um, la uh, in a linear uh, way through the organization, but over to different kinds of roles, different kinds, this is sort of like the agile model. It's it's less um, uh, a single ladder type of structure. So yeah, I think all of them, you find out where your biggest need is and, and work on that one. Yeah, and I, I was just thinking about something you were saying. One more thing on that topic, Scott. Yeah, please. Um, I, I think one of the jobs you have as an L&D leader is to be the anthropologist of your company and to study the behavior of the animals. In other, in other words, what's working and what's not working? What are people looking for? What are people not looking for? You need to know that. You can't force them to take something they don't like. And that seems to change year by year, business cycle by business cycle. So, so that gets back to this issue of taking a good look every, at every program and every um, strategy on a regular basis and revisiting it. What can we do to make this better? What can we make this more relevant? What can we get rid of some stuff people aren't interested in here? On and on and on. That that's part of your job. I love it. So now we've got Chief Capability Officer and hire more Jane Goodalls of the world. But I think that's the that's the that's the takeaway. Um, so let me do this. We've only got a few a few minutes left. As as sages of this space, without question, both of you are. What what parting words might, might you have, what, inspirational otherwise, uh, for folks that are wrestling mightily in this time with uh, with all that we've talked about in terms of current waters, how best to drive their respective organizations forward, um, what degree of urgency should they be having as they close out 2020 and look ahead to 2021. Um, and I'll, I'll make it a toss up if, as, as to who wants to go first on this one. Oh, I'm happy to start, Josh. Okay, so, go ahead. I'll think. <laughs> hey, I'm an optimist. Uh, I, I think I'm genetically an optimist. So I, I was lucky there, but I try to be an optimist by choice. And this has been the most challenging year to remain an optimist uh, that any of my fellow uh, optimists out there uh, have probably ever experienced as well. And so at the same time, there is so much to be excited about and, um, and positive about, about where learning is going or where learning can go. Um, the reasons I feel optimistic about that, it's not just that the technology continues to get better, continues to get more reliable, more, um, uh, stable, more compelling, a better, experience, but I really do see the C-suite um, viewing learning as a critical enabler if they're going to um, successfully execute these transformations that frankly their job is on the line. If I'm the CEO of a large enterprise 
and I fail on digital transformation. I fail on cultural transformation. I, I don't address a, a remote workforce uh, opportunity correctly. A any one of those uh, can land me uh, out of a job. And learning is, su it's not the only enabler to get there uh, in those priorities, but it is a key enabler. That means there should be more organizational support, might mean more investment, or maybe it's a shifting of investment um, with better options out there. So are they easy to integrate? No. Is that an easy job? Not at all. Um, but I think there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic about that. And frankly, if you're not thinking that way, yeah, um, it, it's, it's gonna get a lot harder. So I, I'd say my final thought is be optimistic. Yeah, thank, thank you, Scott. I would agree. I, the other thing I would add is <clears throat> build on your successes. So if you go back to the example Scott gave of, of onboarding uh, MBAs in a bank or this thing I mentioned at Bank of America, find one of the programs you have that's highly successful and learn from that. What, what, what do we learn from that experience that really worked? Can we apply that somewhere else? Because like I said, it, every learning program is slightly different. The audience is different depending on the topic. The business situation is different. Right now, I know a lot of you guys are doing well-being and you know work at home programs and mental resilience and new you know new models of leadership and so forth. Some of those are going to be really successful. DNI. DNI is an example of there's so much DNI training that's not useful that people just do because they feel like they have to. Why don't you find one that really works and then replicate that? And I think if you if you do that this year, you'll learn a lot about what to do in the following years. And 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 that that would be one piece of advice I'd give you that might help in a, in a, some pretty technical and complicated world of learning. Um, on that note, I I, I want to say this to um, to everyone that stayed with us uh, through this hour. Uh, sincerely appreciate uh, the time, the interaction, the effort. Uh, it it, uh, it means a ton. This is uh, I, I often hearken back to the phrase, you know, none of us is smart as all of us, and uh, it it does. It takes all of us to contribute to that in terms of thought and practice and uh, moving it forward. So thank you to all the attendees. A uh, a special thank you, Josh, to you and the candor, the insights, the specificity, and to Scott, you as well. I think sharing from the dual lens that you did today. Uh, helps people. And it's, uh, this is not about a pitch. This is about uh, helping folks understand and that we share these same challenges and problems and helping to move all forward together. Thank you. So, uh, gentlemen, thank, thank you both for that. And um, I'm going to bypass this last poll, but I, I will leave you with this. So I think as, as both Josh and Scott have spoken so eloquently about this critical role of capability building, and as that helps sort of play so foundationally into alignment to business and digital transformation, one of the things that we're trying to spend uh, time on is helping to play that forward for all of you. So um, before we kind of close out here, I, I definitely want to stress um, there's some efforts coming around uh, that NovoEd is sponsoring a podcast series um, together with Red Thread Research and a Learning Preachers Group, LFG, uh, it called Is Purpose Working? Um, so when we think about making this alignment of, of capability building to the business, to digital transformation, uh, over the next few months, uh, Stacia and Danny from Red Thread and Chris from LFG are going to be discussing the purpose of uh, from different angles. So whether it's interviewing CLOs and CHROs and other thought leaders in the field. So um, you can absolutely navigate to this uh, nobody.com forward slash purpose um, to get uh, notified and uh, signed up for that in terms of notifications. And, and uh, and certainly the QR code as well, if that's working for you. So um, I believe we are nearly at time. I'll encourage folks to take that exit interview at the survey at the close of, uh, if you will, survey at the close of this. Um, when you exit out of coaching meeting, it helps us inform our programming. Is this format working? Is this type of uh, dialogue and exchange helpful to you? Um, and uh, a closing note on behalf of everyone at NovoEd, Josh, Scott, um, a massive thank you to you all. Bye for now. <laughs>